if we do nothing else but have a child become comfortable with, with the concept of Bitcoin because they've seen our characters somewhere, then we've done our job. Bitcoin will become at some point the money that we all use. The biggest mind shift that Bitcoin can provide families is that time aspect. Before I got into Bitcoin, I was actually planning to have my first investment property. And then Bitcoin came along and luckily saved me from that headache. As the Bitcoin community continues to grow, there's so many awesome Bitcoiners out there. And so important to get into education and especially educating the very young ones, like those people that only lived in a Bitcoin world. Like if, if you're talking about like 12 year old or five year old or 10 year old people or kids, um, they, they never lived in a world without Bitcoin. So why is it really important to like uh, educate uh, young kids and young adults uh, under 15, under 12 uh, about Bitcoin and why is this your passion? Yeah, so uh, I guess I'll take the tail end of your question first. So it's a passion um, of my wife and I. So both of us are the, the team behind Chamri. Um, and it's our passion because we, we now have two daughters who are both young. So our, our oldest is five um, and our youngest is only six months. Um, but uh, when we launched Chamri, our, our, our older daughter was um, in the womb still. So she was, uh, my wife was pregnant. Uh, we had started learning about Bitcoin back in 2017, 2018. And um, to your question, you know, we saw the future um, and the need to one day educate her um, and any future children that we had. And so uh, we we kind of looked around and realized there really wasn't much of anything out there. You know, this is going back five, six years ago now. So you can imagine how different it was. And so we decided, you know, okay, let's, let's see what we can do on our own. Um, and so that was the, that was the, the why behind we do what everything we do. It's our, it's our kids. And then, um, you know, as we've grown, we've realized, you know, so many Bitcoiners in the space are of similar ages. You know, we're all in the 20s, say 20s to 40s is a big group of us. So you're in that kind of prime marriage, uh, building your family um, focus. And so, you know, we've been able to kind of create a, a community, if you will, of people who are like minded, not only about Bitcoin, but about wanting to raise their families um, and teach their kids from an early age about not just Bitcoin, but really, you know, financial education, independence, um, understanding money um, and, you know, where it all comes from. So that's the, the long version of, uh, of the why behind what we do. Oh, interesting. I think it's so important to have uh, a big why. Um, where's this na name coming from? Shamir? Uh, Sh <laughs> Shamir, yeah. So the name comes from, so our, our first product was, um, was our game. So holding it up here for those that are watching. Um, and so our game is a memory game um, for kids um, age four through adults. Um, we actually have drinking game instructions on the website for those adults that are interested. But uh, the name comes from the fact that it's played similar to the game of memory that probably many kids uh, and adults played as, as kids where you're flipping over cards, trying to remember where the different objects were to make matches. Um, so that's, that's where the big game is based off of, but it teaches about Bitcoin mining and so the the name Shamari, so S H A, is coming from SHA two hundred and fifty six, um, the the algorithm that's used in the mining process, and then uh, Mori comes from the back half of the name Memory. So we we mashed those two words together um, and created Shamari. So yeah, that that's where the uh, the name originated from, and um, kind of is stuck. People like it, um, kind of fun and unique, and has a nice story with it. Nice. Uh, it, it's it's interesting. How, how do you get uh, like the education across? Is it like a memory game? We have to put two things together, and and the the you will learn something with that, or yeah. So there's um, obviously better with visuals, but essentially there's um, two main deck sets of cards: the targets and the nonce. And so the goal of the game, just like in mining, is for you know the computers are out there. They're trying to to um, come up with the correct nonce to hash to then uh, match that target and mine the next block. So in our game, um, there's a stack of cards that are the uh, target cards. You flip over one of them and there's characters on all of them. Once again, for those who are, actually I'll just show the book. So on the top here, you can see we we use monster characters for everything we do. And that's kind of what we're, we're known for. There's one on my shirt here. So every card has a character on it. Uh, you find that first target, you want to flip over a matching nonce. Eventually that happens, creates the first block. So you're mining a blockchain with the cards um, as a group of two or more players. Um, but there's a dice that's used as well that can cause your chain to start to get attacked. Um, if the attack chain never grows longer than the blockchain, 51% attack, game's over for everybody. Um, so it's showing how mining is, it's competitive. You know, we're all trying to mine and earn those rewards, 
but it's also collaborative in the sense that we're all trying to protect that same chain. So from a um, not only a Bitcoin perspective, but something we hear from families and parents is, you know, the fact that all my kids, you know, they're trying to get the most rewards to ultimately win the game. But then if they ever play a game where the chain gets attacked and everybody loses, they realize that we're all in this together. So you can take a very competitive child who then has to realize, you know, I need to, sometimes we need to help the other players through this process to be able to make sure that the chain ultimately gets, uh, gets mined to, to, to a height of 10 in the, in our game. So I mean, teaching not only about Bitcoin, but about collaboration um, and kind of that dynamic as well. That that's that's beautiful. I, like yeah. when when you have the uh, the concept of like there's someone winning because I don't like the games where everyone wins or like you <laughs> get a, that that kind of a concept. But it's nice to have both concepts and there where, where like you have to do something together, but also there's like a winner uh, yeah. type thing. So like that's that's really interesting. How how did you how, how was your experience with gamifying learning like basically that's 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 what you do like you have really nice games but you learn some with with that i mean maybe it's more on the game side than on the learning side like if, if there's like a balance between game and learn it's it's a little bit more on the game side uh, but how did you experience with that yeah so um before before doing any of this uh, neither my wife and i had any experience creating games or, or doing or writing books you know we have three books now or, or manufacturing. So everything's been a learning process, but, um, you know, gamifying learning, um, uh, wasn't easy, especially for this game. There were, it was probably about a year process, um, that it took us to be able to ultimately come out with what is now the game. Um, and the early, um, versions of it were, were not good. They weren't fun. Um, they were overly complex, um, you know, for, for being able to play the games, especially for children. So, uh, like I said, everything we do is using these characters that we've created. And um, before creating the characters, we we're just trying to use information on the cards. So no really fun visuals and real realize not only is that not as fun, but it's a lot harder to create matching pairs from a mental perspective to remember those sorts of things. So we wanted to create these images that people would remember. And so it was a whole learning process having um, family and friends, you know, test the game out and play with us being subjected to uh, some some boring times, <laughs> painstaking games just to work through that stuff. But, you know, what came out the, at the end is something we're, we're proud of. Um, you know, not only the game, we have the, the single game and then building everything around these character sets. One thing that um, Mallory and I have always said is, you know, if we do nothing else but have people remember, um, have a child become comfortable with, with the concept of Bitcoin because they've seen our characters somewhere, then we've done our job. Because that comfort level is going to then let them know that, you know, Bitcoin isn't something scary or complex or um, only for adults. You know, it's just a thing that's out there and it's going to be commonplace for them. And so if our if our characters can do that, um, then that that's the battle that we're trying to, to win. What do you think does the, that to a generation that lives in Bitcoin from such a young age gets to know about Bitcoin from such a long age. Like I just imagine like there's like a kid of a Bitcoiner now who's like maybe, I don't know, seven years old. Uh, and he, she has like this, this games. Maybe she also has a, like a little bit of a wallet where a lightning wallet where she gets some, some pocket money that she can exchange with maybe another friend that also has a lightning wallet. They like get, get to know about Bitcoin and then about the, the things so early on, like a little bit like the kids with, with, with uh, phones are like way better than, than yeah. someone that is like 70 years old, uh, yeah. because they have it from, from the, the onwards on. Like, how, how do you imagine, uh, a generation from like, they are now 10 years old and they, they live through that. How different can that be for, for the world? Yeah. And the nice thing is, um, for our personal happenstance, you know, we don't really even need to imagine it because we see it in our daughter, our older daughter. Um, so she's, she's five now. Um, many, some people out there listening might've met her because, um, a year ago when she was three, actually, uh, we started taking her to, to conferences when we have booths. Um, so she's there and part of what we did, um, to help bring her into, um, the fun of the conference, the booth, um, learn how to, to sell, uh, that atmosphere is she wanted to create a product of her own. And so she created, um, lot, First, she only had bracelets, so she she made um, beaded bracelets, um, and she had a bowl of them there at um, in Miami at the Bitcoin Conference 2023. 
and then um, had her set up there with a, um, a little sign and a QR code that went to her personal Lightning wallet. Um, and people could come over and it was all donation based. So there wasn't a price on them. Uh, but she was literally standing at our, our booth for three days straight, you know, eight to 10 hours, um, asking people if they want to buy, buy her bracelets. Uh, many people said yes. Many people said no, which is also a, a learning experience. But to your point, she was, they'd say, you know, how do I pay? And she would say, oh, you know, here, this is my lightning wallet. Um, here's, you know, scan this QR code and, and you, in a way you go. So her being then three, um, you know, got comfortable with taking payment in Bitcoin like it was nothing else. Um, she knows now, you know, this is now a year later. She's been to, um, I believe, four conferences since we, we just got back from Nashville a couple of weeks ago. Um, and, and both kids were there with us and, and Charlotte was there selling bracelets, keychains and necklaces now. So she's expanded her product line, um, but she's able to, to accept payment. She doesn't think anything of it. Um, she thinks of Bitcoin as just another form of money like anything else. Um, she knows enough that uh, if you ask her, you know, she'll say, you know, you want to spend your dollars, not your Bitcoin, because Bitcoin goes up and dollars go down. So she understands the concept of, of holding and, and, and that sort of stuff at a very minimal basis. Um, and so seeing, seeing it through her eyes lets us know that it's just going to be second nature to all these kids, to your point, you know, picking up an iPhone, um, an iPad, turning on TVs, going through apps, you know, it's all, it's all the same concept. Um, and so being able to live it every day with her and then down the line with her, when her sister gets older, um, I think we're all in, in good hands. Um, and really it's the adults, um, as we all know, that are, that are harder to teach and to, to change the mindset of. Is that, um, do you think like, there's always this question in my mind and I asked that like since the first episode, basically, and I did not come up with a nice answer to that. Um, if, if we have Bitcoin and for me, it's like abundantly clear that Bitcoin will become at some point the, the money that we all use. It's just a question of like, is it five years or 500 years? <laughs> like that's a, the time variant is like really hard to predict, but I think there's no question about like that it happens at some point. Um, for me at least. And, and the question that I ask myself so much is like, what will that change? Like is, is, is changing the un fundamental, uh, layer of money is the changing the, the unit of account that we exchange value with is, is just exchanging that, exchanging something in, in the human brain. Is that changing the, the, the world fundamentally? Or is it just money in the end of the day and humans are still humans and humans will uh, still steal, humans will still do do bad things and good things uh, and it does not do a lot. Do, do you have some some answers or some insights as, as you have a lot of context also with like new generation that gets in Bitcoin? Yeah, I think uh, obviously, like you said, who knows what will actually happen? I guess I could answer it from what I would hope happens. Uh, and the biggest part of that hope is that um, families um, such as ours or any other ones that are able to um, adopt the Bitcoin side of things and see the, the long-term value in doing so are able to recoup the, the time that they're able to spend together and enjoy each other and go on vacations and um, have less stress around the financial aspects of life and um, live more free. And so that's, that's part of the benefit that, you know, we we are able to see in um in the future and so how long that takes for for that to shift from just kind of the um the hardcore set of bitcoiners like like you and i and maybe you know others out there into the vast population i don't know but to me the hopefully the biggest mind shift um that bitcoin can provide families is that time aspect because i think so much of it is has been taken away um from past generations you know um, both both parents having to work or, um, you know, really you're, you're sending your kid off for eight, six, eight, 10 hours a day, um, coming home, eating dinner, going to bed, doing the same thing over again, five days a week. And then on the weekends, you're exhausted from those five days a week. And you know, maybe you're catching up on going grocery shopping or cleaning or whatever it is. But if there's a, a better balance that can be brought to life for, for families, um, that would be the the most uh, beneficial and, and beautiful thing that that could come out of all this in, in my mind. And I think it will come. 
because I think uh, we get more efficient in, in, in doing things. So we will get more efficient in providing the base layer of, of life way more um, effectively and easily uh, with robotics, with AI, with all the things that we are uh, developing, uh, which hopefully gives <laughs> the humans more time to uh, focus on the most significant and most pressing things that we actually have to focus on, like uh, getting to maybe other planets, if, if that's something that we want to pursue uh, and, and do do the things that uh, we are passionate about and not the things that <laughs> ke ke keeps the bills running. Like that's, that's a thing that's like a really <laughs> sad life at, at some point, if you do that too long, like obviously there are seasons to life and at some point you have to hustle and, and, and get the bills done, but uh, it, it should not be like a, a main thing. Why did you actually um, get Bitcoin in the first place? Like, how did you get uh, get into it, and, and why? What what made it click? That's always interesting for me to know. Yeah, um, my story is uh, my rabbit hole story is very similar to so many other people in that kind of 2017, 2018 range. Where um, you know, late 2017, I I think just saw internet chatter about you know Bitcoin price going up, and then obviously altcoins and all that stuff that came about, and so um started becoming interesting interested then um went down the typical um cycle of buying the shit coins and then um studying and, and luckily in my case um it, it was only you know two or three months before realizing that everything else could be ignored um uh, focused on the bitcoin so um grateful for that and i think part of the reason it was able to click um quicker for me is um of my background so um, before all this, uh, after going to college, I was, um, in accounting. Um, so I kind of have a, a numbers, um, uh, financial background, um, for a few years. And then after that, I actually transitioned to a job uh, that was in the, um, education technology space, um, helping to create, um, online products, um, in various roles from product creation to marketing to, um, sales. And so my background is a mixture of numbers. Um, and understanding ledgers and the importance of verifiability um, mixed with creativity and um, understanding the value in um, technology. And so I think the, the background of those two things syncing together, um, I've also always, from a young age, been prone to be a more of a saver than a spender. Um, so understanding the value of, you know, saving and compounding and that sort of stuff. So it was just kind of the perfect storm um, where once I started reading and learning and um, listening uh, to things about Bitcoin, that it, it was pretty quick for me to, to start understanding. And luckily, um, you know, at the time I'd been married for a few years with Mallory and well, it wasn't really until we started creating Shamari that she had a full interest in it. She was very supportive of the, the interest I had prior to that um, and being able to, to um, financially start going down that rabbit hole together as well. So that's kind of the, the journey that I took. Interesting. And it's, for, for me, it's always interesting. Uh, what's the most important for, uh, for people in Bitcoin? Uh, like what, what, what is it for you? Like, uh, some say like, oh, it's like that we, we have to have like the store of value or some like the uh, fact that you can just like, uh, have the payments across borders because they like to move a lot around and then fear this it's a pain in the ass when you try to move <laughs> money around so like what's for you like the the most Im important thing that, that bitcoin does yeah and i think like you said it's a you're always gonna get different answers from different people on that especially depending on where they're based in the world and their their life circumstances around you know money you know being lucky in this case growing up in in America, um, in a um, in a place where you know, as a kid, you don't have to worry, you know, about your money being devalued in your face overnight. Obviously, we all know it is happening behind the scenes. Um, I think the most important thing on our side, of, for us particularly, is kind of make you know that that store of value, um, making sure that you know the hard cap of twenty one million. You know that, in my mind, is where it all starts, and then everything else kind of leads out from there from importance but um number one for for me would be the the 21 million and the hard cap and um, understanding the importance of why things with scarcity have have value um and i think from you know growing up you always hear about you know real estate having scarcity and um having you know 
we live in San Diego, which is definitely uh, on the higher end of, of prices for real estate from a young age. So I always saw how things with scarcity, even though you can always create more houses, there's limited space here in our city. So I think that's also what played a role into understanding scarcity where I saw, I visually saw how people in the real estate market were able to make money from a scarce supply of things that people wanted. In a, um, and so being able to transfer that over into a, a digital supply where it's actually true scarcity, um, true verifiability, um, and all the other good things that come along with it um, plays a role in, in my answer as well. Yeah. Uh, why did you not go then uh, do the real estate? Like if uh, you, you saw that, it was there like a decision where you made like consciously now, I don't want real estate because of that? Uh, I think, well, probably because from, you know, at a young age, when you just have the money to do it, you know, being, you, it's a much more uh, <laughs> a higher threshold to be able to, to go down that route. You know, when you're, obviously when you're a teenager, that's impossible, but coming out of college, you know, you need to, to focus on other things to be able to, to make ends meet. And so the nice thing about Bitcoin is, you know, you can have a dollar and you can start your journey and you can have less than a dollar. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't really matter. And so that low stakes of entry um, is, is very important for people, no matter where they are in the world. Interesting. Yeah. yeah because I, before I got uh, into Bitcoin, I was actually planning or like even talking to banks and stuff like that to, to have my first uh, investment property. Uh, and then Bitcoin came along and luckily saved me from that headache because yeah. now I speak with so many uh, 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 real estate investors who are real estate investors and shifting a little bit to Bitcoin, prior real estate, real estate investors are not uh, now only in Bitcoin and they're all saying the same thing. It's a lot of headache. Uh, the, the passive income is not passive because you have to work <laughs> for that a lot. Yeah. And it's way more easy to sort of just build a business that makes sense uh, than have real estate. So like, obviously, a lot of uh, millionaires were created with, with real estate, but it's a lot of headache. It's, it's, it's not like, oh, yeah, buy a property. The tenants will, yeah. will pay and everything is, is perfect. So yeah. I just had a question in my mind that I never had uh, in my mind uh, in my 200 podcasts. Um, why 21? Did you ever research about that? Like I, I never researched that, the topic. Why exactly 21? I, I never, I don't think I've ever researched it. Um, and I don't know if there's an actual answer, if it was just a number that you know, Satoshi came up with, but it's a, it's a good question. Yeah, I just like, oh shit, I never asked that question. And it doesn't, doesn't come, come along that I did not ask a question. Um, but yeah, probably, probably the, the answer is not as interesting. Uh, otherwise, we probably would have known uh, why. But I, I will look it up after the podcast. It's interesting. Yeah. Uh, perfect. Then um, one question that I also have, uh, as you try to teach us with the books about uh, money uh, and also with, for young uh, kids, how, how do you do that? Is this like a, a, a normal story where you kind of get Bitcoin in the row? Or? Yeah. And so um, the, uh, we started writing um, stories after launching our, our card game. And so our first book was released in 20, uh, 2021. Um, and so at the time, our daughter was you know, one-ish. Um, and so we're very big into the reading um, to your children side of things in our in our household, you know, during the day, nighttime readings, that sort of stuff. So, um, you know, when they're tod infants and, and toddlers, um, you're very familiar with the traditional books around um, that you probably grew up with, you know, Good Night Moon, um, you know, everything else. And so we had, speaking of Good Night Moon, read that to her many, many times and it clicked, well, you know, there should be Bitcoin books for kids. So our, our first book was actually um, Good Night Bitcoin. And so it, it tells the story of um, Satoshi and how uh, creating Bitcoin for the first time in a, in a low stakes rhyming way. And so, uh, you know, everything we do is is done, like I said, using these characters. And um, if you ask many people who know about our company and, and the families, you know, their kids know who uh, Satoshi is because of, of this character. So this is Satoshi in our books. He's our, our most famous monster, if you will. Um, and so our stories are meant to just be that, that low stakes entry point fun. Um, and so between Goodnight Bitcoin, um, our second book was, uh, if you give a monster a Bitcoin. So these two are very, very similar, um, more that infant toddler audience. And then in July of this year, we released our third book, uh, which is more of that five to, to 12 year old, which is uh, Satoshi Nakamoto and his Bitcoin invention. 
Um, and this is actually the first book we didn't actually author. Um, so we published it on behalf of our friend, Tomer Strolight, who um, some people might know in the, the Bitcoin community. So he had actually written this book years ago, uh, had never gotten around to to going through the, the creation process to putting it out there and, and reached out to us and said, hey, um, love what you guys are doing. I, I want to have this book as part of, you know, um, the books you guys are releasing. Let's make that happen. And so uh, about a month ago, we, we launched that. And so it's a perfect um, addition um, to what we offer. And, um, you know, our goal is to make things fun, low stakes. They're not, they're not very dense. They're meant to just be um, informative at the, the highest of levels to get that child's interest, start learning keywords, whether it's just learning the words, Bitcoin, um, uh, Satoshi, how, um, nodes, you know, they're all worked in there, but they're not things that kids, you know, it's not a textbook. So it's not uh, scary and, and daunting for them. And, and, the nice thing is the kids that are being targeted for these books, many of them are still um, not able to read yet. And so it's usually the parent in many cases or grandparent or whoever it is that's reading to the child. And we've heard many stories and we've actually seen ourselves with family members around us who aren't Bitcoiners yet, where they've read the stories to our kids. And that spurs question in the adult's head as well. Um, and because they're, they're concepts that they don't know. And so while the stories are for kids, if you have adults in your life who are who have children and then are being um, are, are then reading these books to the child and they aren't Bitcoiners yet, the adult themselves, they're also at least learning a little bit and keeping their interest about what, you know, what is this Bitcoin thing? And so it can work both ways. How cautious were you with, did you have like a time, yeah, of course you had a time where you uh, read the normal books to, to the kids to, where you're like, oh shit, uh, I, I don't want uh, my kid to hear that. Is, is there something like that in, in kids' books also where you're like, oh, I, I don't like that my kid learns about that or is there like there's something in the book that, I don't agree with, so I don't, don't want my kid to know. I, I just thought about it now because like a kid's book is like um, learning the kid and, and pushing it in like in a, in a positive, uh, mm -hmm. good direction, but you can also use yeah. the same yeah. thing in a, in a ne negative way. And because yeah, <laughs> kids are probably uh, way more uh, influence, like you can influence them way better than someone that is like uh, 40 years old and already has some filters uh, and some guards uh, up. Yeah. No, there's, You, uh, you definitely have to keep your eye out. Um, luckily, you know, we're pretty good at that sort of thing. And um, as we're reading, you know, as we're reading to our, our kids, you got a sense of something's coming that you want to, to shy away from. And so you can either change, maybe sometimes you maybe just need to change the word slightly if it's something small and you just kind of jump over and if they're not, they're not reading yet, so they don't know the difference. Um, other times you might be reading a book that you realize is going in a, a direction for whatever reason uh, that you don't um, think it, you want to take it. Um, you kind of just say, okay, you know, let's switch to the next book or that sort of thing. So as a parent, yeah, you you have, especially as they're young and they're they're learning how to read, you have that freedom to be able to to shift things around and 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 such. Obviously, as they become older and they're starting to read books themselves, um, some of that could get a little harder. But um, in general, you know, there's so many, not even just speaking of Bitcoin, but so many amazing books that are out there, creative books, fun ones. Um, you know, depending on your child's interest, you know, our daughter loves fairies and unicorns. And so there's, there's a plethora of books in our house that are about fairies and unicorns that you really don't have to worry about the, uh, the topic being anything inappropriate, um, when you're talking about that sort of stuff. And so, yeah, it's a, it's something to be conscious of as a parent. Um, uh, but it's also something that's fairly easy to, to, you know, control and, and make sure that the, um, the messages that are being brought about are ones that um, you think are, are safe and, and appropriate for your kids. Are I also doing homeschooling or is, uh, is she in a school? Yeah. So our, our oldest is, is homeschooled. Um, our, our youngest will be as well once, you know, she, she grows up um, in a few years, but yeah, she's been homeschooled for a few years now. Technically um, in America, she'd be starting kindergarten um, this year. Um, but we've, you know, Been using a homeschool um, curriculum, if you will, um, for a few years now, and she's um, she loves it. Is um, she's a sponge, um, and most kids are. And so, I think one of the things that many parents shy away from, or maybe they're afraid of, or they don't realize, is just how soon you can start teaching your kids anything. So, I'm not just talking Bitcoin. You know, math, um, science, um, how to read letter sounds. You know, start them as soon as you can. You know, as you're talking to them. Um, and they'll, they'll become interested and they'll, they'll pick it up. Um, our 
our older daughter is um, very creative, but also very um, mathematic driven. Um, she goes to sleep every night holding a calculator and doing math problems. Um, and so it's uh, extremely cute and um, heartwarming to see that she loves math so much. Uh, but, you know, at the same time, she'll spend hours a day coloring and drawing pictures and doing art um, or doing science experiments. So as soon as your kids start showing interest in certain subjects, you know, just help them learn along that process. And um, don't, you know, obviously homeschooling isn't for everybody. Um, also, some people just, you know, have going back to the earlier question, talking about time, you have to have time and a, a flexible schedule to be able to implement that sort of thing. Um but, you know, if you do have the time to be able to do it, uh, it's something that I think both the, the kid and the, the family as a whole can benefit from. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis, I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is to keep the Bitcoin. Keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit bitbox.swiss slash Robin to get your Bitbox. And if you really want to bulletproof your self-custody setup, your security setup, and maybe even your citizenship set up you have to talk to the bitcoin way if you go to the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash robin you get a 30 minute free call where you can dive deep with them if your self-custody setup is secure if your citizenship is secure or maybe might be improvable or your digital footprint in general is secure. They are the experts in cybersecurity, in Bitcoin self custody, and how to be a secure, sovereign individual in general. And last but not least, I have something completely new for you guys. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made a perfect Bitcoin watch. That's the perfect, subtle, elegant way to go out there and show that you are a Bitcoiner. And that watch brand is Bitcoin. Bitcoin only. Make sure to check out the link in the description for this amazing coin vigilante timepieces. Those watches are amazing. I love them so much. It was really hard for me to pick the one that I want to have because there are a lot of great options. I went with the new transparency edition. They are all limited. So grab yours. Those will not be available for a long time, but there will come new models and new amazing designs along the way. It's interesting for me, like the uh, homeschooling part. Obviously, like, not everyone can do it, but you probably have, or maybe you have friends in your circle that who also have kids, and they uh, already have sent them to school. Do you see differences? Like, do you, do you see like? Because I think like a lot of in in the school, it's like oh, <laughs> you like a lot of people in the class. You sit down, uh, you learn to not ask questions too much. Uh, <laughs> you. You learn all, all those horrible things that I think uh, we know all about. Do, do you see already differences or is it too early? Yeah, no, definitely see differences. And obviously every kid is every kid is different on their own and every school is different or preschool or daycare program. Um, I think one of the biggest differences that we um, see is particularly in, potentially in kids that, um, let's say, have gone to not just school, but daycare from a, a young age. Um, and so they're around, you know, kids from, you know, for eight hours a day, starting at, let's say, you know, a year old or two years old. Whereas um, in the case of our daughters, um, particularly the older one, she she's grown up around us and adults. Um, and so we've always spoken to her like she's an adult and uh, um, given her the chance to be you know, the mature child that we wanted her to be. And that's, that's what happened. Um, but I think so many times when kids, particularly very young kids start going off into daycare or childcare roles where they're, they're all around, you know, five, 10, 15 other kids all day with one adult is they get talked to like a, a child or a baby for the majority of their, their days. And so it doesn't give them the chance to um, gain that maturity 
that any kid could have if they're, you know, you talk to them like an adult, like same thing, you know, I was just saying around their sponges, you know, if you give them the opportunity to be mature and to start learning mature and responsible things and not talking to them as if um, they can't do it, you know, they'll surprise you and they'll, they'll do it. And so um, I don't think our, you know, like I said, our daughter was three, almost four, um, when we took her to the first conference last year in Miami. I don't think the majority of three-year-olds um, would have been uh, able to sit and be at a booth for eight to 10 hours a day, asking people if they want to buy a bracelet, strangers being told no, having fun. Like you just have to put them in those situations to let them learn. Um, and, you know, you know, just the world will be their oyster after that. That's, uh, that's, I never heard that because like, it's, it's so interesting when you think about uh, a kid growing up, uh, uh, with more with adults, how's it, how's it with socializing? Is, is she in, in any groups? Like, because when you put it in school, when you put it in kindergarten, it's, it's pretty, pretty easy because the, the, the social circles there. Yeah. And it's also something that I noticed with myself and with, with others, like you learn how to socialize properly with like 20 years old because till then your social circle is just like oh where do you train and where do you go to school and that's uh, like a social circle and maybe family uh, and uh, it's interesting that your kids have to learn this from 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 way early on and are probably way better with like 14 than the most 20 year old yeah no and definitely and, you know i think to no surprise you know when you when people think about homeschooling they the, one of the first um, people not um, in the homeschooling side of things think, oh, well, you know, how does how does your kid make friends or how are they going to be around other kids, whatever. Um, but there's so many, particularly, you know, we live in a big city, so there's so many different opportunities out there. And so she's always had, uh, you know, different groups, you know, she plays soccer, she plays baseball, um, she's on, uh, does, you know, swim. She's, um, my wife is part of another homeschool um, group that, uh, meets, um, weekly, um, um, if you will. So they're around other homeschool kids, uh, beginning, beginning here in a few weeks. Um, she'll be going to, a. it's called a, an enrich homeschool enrichment center a couple of days a week where, um, they're able to, uh, have kind of both free play, but also kind of structured learning experiences, um, putting on plays, doing science experiments. So that sort of stuff. So you can, you can homeschool in many different ways um, and you can socialize, make sure that socialization, socialization is there in many different ways outside of using school as that main, you know, six hours a day where you're six to seven hours a day or eight hours if you're doing after school program um, or even more than that, you know, where it's just a, it's thought of as a daycare in my mind for most parents where, yeah, you're sending them there to learn, but we all know like kids aren't learning for eight hours a day, nor do you need to. Um, you know, it's surprising how fast and how little time, especially when they're younger, you need to put in to be able to have them start learning things. You know, if, you know, starting when she's two or three years old, even before that, you can start doing, you know, math problems, that sort of stuff for 20 or 30 minutes a day. And the growth will be something you will imagine. So it doesn't take eight hours a day to, to learn these things. So Get, get your learning and how you need to. And then you have so much other time in the day to enjoy all those other socializations with other, whether it's families or whoever in your, in your homeschool network that are out there. That sounds interesting. Yeah. I, I love that a lot. Um, obviously I was not homeschooled. I think, I don't even know if it's in Austria possible. I know it's not in Germany possible, but I think Austria is actually possible. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's a way better. It's, it's, it's way better to, to do it like that. I think, and it also teaches responsibility. I think, I think we, we, we kind of have a lack of, of taking responsibility in, in our uh, society at broad. And which brings me a little bit to, to my next question uh, that I want to jump in uh, that, because it was just in my mind now. Um, Bitcoin banks, do, do you think that we will get to a state where everyone is their own bank and they hold their own keys and they, they, they do their hard work themselves? Um, is that even possible? Or uh, is, 
is that just like, oh yeah, it, there will be Bitcoin banks. Most people will hold it with some custodian. Uh, and my, right now, most people hold it with custodians. Uh, only a small, small, small group of Bitcoiners actually have a hardware wallet. Uh, I think the numbers are around like 5% or something like that, what I heard. I heard even numbers are around 2%, but this, this seems very low. Uh, but do you think that we come to a point where uh, maybe with trends like homeschooling, maybe with other trends uh, that is going on, that we come to a more responsible society that takes their own keys in their own hands? Yeah, I think um, that number will definitely grow. Um, I think that's just inevitable, but it'll definitely, I think, be slow, slow going. Um, and it probably won't be till these future generations, you know, um, you grow up learning about it and having it be second nature come about. But with that said, I don't think, I think the traditional bank will probably all ultimately go away or change if you will, but there'll probably always be some need for custody, uh, custody in some form, whether it's for um, just hold, holding it um, or obviously uh, the growth of, you know, Bitcoin back loans, um, people wanting to be able to, to use it that way and, and everything else, you know, there's going to need to be called traditional financial instruments with a, a Bitcoin wrapper on them, if you will, um, that, that come about and make it easy, um, for people to, to live their life in that, that way. And, you know, the growth over the past couple of years and those sorts of things, I, I think probably gets underrepresented. I think a lot has happened positively to be able to, you know, make, um, uh, multi-sig easier to use in, in various ways. Uh, obviously, uh, during the last uh, bear market, you know, loans and that sort of stuff became a hot topic, understandably, since it wasn't done in a, a safe way in many cases. But there are safe ways, ultimately, that that can be done um, down the line. And so I think we'll see more and more of that. And, you know, five years from now, it's going to look completely different. And 50 years from now, it'll look even more different. I think so, too. I hope so, at least. Uh, uh, my hopes are. I, I always advocate for self custody, uh, it's, but it's it's hard. I even have friends that are full on, hundred percent in Bitcoin, and they all have it on exchanges. And I'm like, but it's all already a, a good part that they have Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, coming uh, to one more question about parenting because it, it is really interesting for me. Yeah. Uh, I did not plan to have this question <laughs> on parenting, but I think it's really interesting. Um, you said also that you learn uh, from very young age sales, basically with standing on the booth, something that I experienced the first time with 19 years old. So I think uh, having that from a young uh, uh, age on is, is amazing to learn those small lessons with, with, with yeah. rejections, with keep going and stuff like that. So young already um and learning her to be way more independent uh than than any like uh, other kid in that age um how do you have some some strategies some some things because you, you mentioned before the the age group uh, i know that the the diff, the average fewer of mine is like between 40 45 years old uh i know that most of them have kids like uh, because most of my guests have kids most of when I ask in the community, they, they seem to have like kids or want to have kids, yeah. uh, which is amazing to see in the Bitcoin community. Like the, the kids uh, rate is just way higher than I think in the, in the average, uh, uh, average uh, society out there. Um, do you have some advice or some, some, some uh, tip that you like, you want to know that other parents also know about that? Um, just kind of like the selling process and teaching and that sort of thing. Is that, that's or it. just, or, or just in general, like uh, with what you learn with with parenting, yeah. with raising an independent, critical uh, thinking child that is not just <laughs> doing what it's supposed to do. Yeah, um, I, honestly, the biggest tip is from a young age: just treat treat them like an adult, treat them like they're more mature than you think they are. Um, talk to them, um, bring them into the conversations, help them, let them help your family make choices around, you know, different topics, you know, whether it's, you know, creating a, a menu for the week, um, you, where you're going on vacation or, you know, what you're watching on TV, it doesn't, it doesn't matter, you know, bring them in and treat them like they are one of you, as opposed to, um, a, just a, a child, um, is probably the biggest thing because that level of maturity is what's going to then help them understand so many other things and give them the confidence to know that they can make those choices themselves down the line um and you know 
it's okay also to be wrong. You know, sometimes, you know, you make a choice altogether and it's the wrong thing. And it's no different than, you know, when she's at the booth and somebody tells her no, um, and, you know, it just, you know, let it roll off, ask the next person, um, and go on from there. And so, yeah, I think it just treat them more mature than you can even realize they are. And especially as, as a baby and as an infant. Really cool. And uh, one thing that I also noticed with the, uh, products that, that you have, uh, it's a hard topic, Wexel, but, uh, uh, just saw it. You have the stem sign, uh, on, on the products. Um, yeah. this is the, uh, this is like the, the, what is STEM again? It's, it's like science, technology, engineering. Yeah, and exactly. Yeah. Um, wh why is it on there? Like what, wh what is important about that? Yeah. So great question. Um, and so STEM, uh, particularly here in the, in the States, um, also known, sometimes known as STEAM. So that would be science, technology, education, arts, and math. So two different versions of similar things, um, is, um, something that's very focused on and call it the, the traditional education space um, in the States and, and worldwide. And so uh, there's an organization called stem.org um, that does a few different things, but one of it is um, they authenticate books, games, other products to um, say that they match different STEM um, uh, uh, curriculum. So that it, you know, if you're using it in a education environment, you, you know that it, it's teaching along the guidance of a, a STEM program in some way. And so you can change it back to standards or whatever it may be. And so for our purposes, um, we were able to get our, our games so, um, is STEM authenticated as well as all three books. And so the, the importance of that really is uh, making it easier for those, whether it's a homeschool teachers or, you know, teachers in the traditional space, uh, libraries, um, STEM centers, after school programs, you name it. Um, if there's a, a Bitcoiner out there that wants to bring it into those settings, they could, cut, you know, and obviously they're probably uh, the minority at this point, uh, but they could bring it to their principal or their academic advisor, or whoever it is, to be able to say, you know, I want to, I want to wrap, um, you know, the Shamari game into my curriculum for X, Y, Z. Um, you know, it's teaching about Bitcoin, but it, you know, it's STEM authenticated. You know, it's going to teach them the standard, the standard, that standard, um, you know, it helps that conversation um, have less friction, hopefully, um, so that they can, we can start getting in there. And there's um, some great Bitcoin focused educational groups out there that, that utilize um, our game and our books in those sorts of ways. So um, whether it's uh, Doosan down in, in Honduras, that is Rotan Academy, um, or there's a gentleman uh, named Zach who does after school Bitcoin STEM after school programs um, in, in the States back East um, and some other ones worldwide, you know, being able to have that authentication can help in those sorts of settings. That's, uh, that's definitely, uh, in some settings you need that like label, the, the don't trust verify yeah. is not in all of our lives. <laughs> exactly. if, every, if everyone thinks like, don't trust verify, I think we would not need, uh, all those signs. I, I mean, I live in Austria and like the, the titles are really big here. Like if you have some titles in front of your name, uh, that's valued very highly and uh, I don't get it. <laughs> it's very high. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, it doesn't yeah. doesn't mean anything for me. Exactly. Um, coming closer to the end of the podcast, uh, what can we uh, learn from you besides all the things that we already talked about uh, on on the podcast? Oh, geez, um, I think the biggest thing for maybe people out there besides kind of the learning about our products and parenting and Bitcoin families would be, you know, I think there's so many people out there with their own expertise and in, in various areas of, of, of anything that maybe are, you know, have the bat ideas in the back of their head about having, you know, they want to work in Bitcoin or they want to create something around Bitcoin or whatever um, that journey uh, or dream could be. And I think one thing would be just to say, do it, um, start, start the podcast, create the company, create the product. Uh, I'm sure you feel similar, you know, before you started your podcast, having an idea, you know, just do it. You'll learn. Um, that's what we did. Like I said, at the beginning, you know, so what, six years ago now, uh, we had literally, we had never created a game before. We had never written a book. We had never created a plush toy. We had never gone through manufacturing processes, created a website, e-commerce, you name it, zero experience. Um, but we just dove head first, started creating, um, learning the process. The nice thing is, you know, 
as the Bitcoin community continues to grow. Um, there's so many awesome Bitcoiners out there, you know, no different than how we got connected through Stackmore, um, I believe made the introduction. And so, you know, worldwide, it doesn't matter where you are, um, you know, everything's digital. So um, being able to tap into that network and if you have questions, uh, you'll find people out there that that will help answer and, and be able to to help guide you. Uh, but the, the first step and the biggest steps are going to be um, yourself and being able to take that chance. Um, obviously, I'm not saying go quit your job tomorrow um, in most cases, but, you know, just just do it. Uh, maybe it won't work, but at least you could then say it worked. You, you did it. You're not going to have that regret regret because, you know, I could sit here saying, you know, you know if Sean Marie stopped tomorrow for whatever reason, myself and, and Mallory and, and our family, I'd, I'd feel successful in, in not in that, you know, it's made us all this money or anything, but in that it's, I did it. We did it together. Um, so many people enjoyed what we created and, um, you know, that's the satisfaction that we, we wanted from it and you could have the same. And I think the Bitcoin community is a special one as it's really generous. Yeah. Uh, they are really helpful people in there. Uh, it's, it's one of the biggest problems. Uh, th that's kind of origin story, how I came to have a daily Bitcoin podcast. I just wanted to have a Bitcoin podcast once a week uh, at first. And I came from that sales background in IT security where I was like, okay, you write 10 people and maybe one has a meeting with you. And from all those 20 people that you have meetings with, maybe one buys something. Yeah. Uh, but it's no problem because, yeah. But uh, with, with Bitcoin, it's like, oh, you write 20 people. Hey, do you want to be on my podcast? And yeah, 20 yes came back. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you don't even have the podcast yet. Like, <laughs> there's not, not one episode out. So that really surprised me. And then my calendar was full with, with uh, podcast episode bookings. And I had no podcast and I just like started and I was like, oh, interesting. Yeah, now, now I have a podcast three times a week, then four times and five times. And then at, at some point I was like, ah, fuck it. <laughs> I do it every day now. Uh, and like one month later, I was like, oh, I can actually live from that. And, and now I do it full time since uh, half, no, four months or five months now full time. And it's it feels just uh, so amazing. So I can... 100% attest to what you just said with uh, just doing it and, and, and believing in yourself and, and, and like, yeah, you, you will find if you really, if, if you really like what you do and if you really are passionate about it and, and, and you actually try your best, you probably will find a way sooner or later. Like it yeah. depends on, on how long, but uh, you will find a way somehow. Really cool. Then, uh, yeah, thank you already for, for, for the podcast. We have one last thing, the, the end routine of the podcast where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is. Uh, and, uh, your question is an interesting one, uh, but a little bit, uh, generic. You can take it wherever you want to take it. What is for you the main problem, uh, that Bitcoin is solving for you? I think, uh, the main problem that Bitcoin solves for us would be, um, we touched on it earlier in the conversation is the, the time aspect for our family. Um, you know, without quite honestly, without Bitcoin and starting to learn about it years ago, um, we probably wouldn't be able to homeschool our kids. We wouldn't be able to have as much um, time freedom as we do um, currently um, because of it. So, you know, I couldn't, my wife and I talk about this all the time. Neither of us can imagine, you know, going back to the days when every, you know, five days a week, having to get up, drive somewhere, sit in an office all day, drive home, do it all over again. Um, you know, it seems like a lifetime ago, even though it wasn't very long ago um, in reality, but trying to imagine that, um, doing that now um, after uh, having kids and, and having the, the time that we have with them is something that, you know, neither of us ever would want to go back to and, you know, thanks to, to taking the time to understand Bitcoin, learn about it, um, and understand the, the long-term value in it is is what it's provided us. So that that would be my answer. That is amazing. Uh, it's beautiful. I feel like in in a sense, like uh, I made a post yesterday with like the only thing more valuable than than Bitcoin is time. So I think there is a second best. That, that time is the second <laughs> best asset that you can have. Probably the the best one, and, and Bitcoin is the second yeah. best. Uh, and really cool. Thank you for taking the time already. Uh, and uh, where can people uh, find you when they want to ask you questions or something like that? 
Yeah. So um, obviously from, from the Shamari side of things, um, our website is shamari.com, S-H-A-M-O-R-Y, um, or on um, any social media, you know, at Play Shamari, uh, most active on, on Twitter or X or whatever you want to call it. Um, so feel free to, to learn more about the company in those spots or um, for myself um, on Twitter X. Uh, I'm Scott M. Sibley. Um, DMs are open in both spots. So feel free to, uh, to reach out. Um, always happy to, to chat, um, answer any questions, um, jump on podcasts, you know, you name it. Um, and obviously, you know, as we're um, at different conferences, um, always happy to, to see smile, smiling faces come over and, and either see you again or, or meet for the first time. So if you ever see us somewhere, um, definitely come over, say hi um, and, and uh, love to chat. Perfect. Thank you so much for, for being on, for taking the time. Also for everyone watching and listening, as always, thank you for being here and joining us today. Uh, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye.